Welcome everybody to the anxiety and stress management talk that we're having today at ETSU. Whether you suffer from anxiety or know somebody in your family who suffers from anxiety or you want to work with people who have anxiety and or stress in their lives, this talk is for you. I realize we have a mixed audience of people who have uh, some background in this, maybe some healthcare background, maybe some college or other high school psychology background. Other people have no background in it at all. So I'm going to try to target all people in this audience. So if you don't know some of the terms or terminology, don't worry about it. We'll kind of move along and I think everything will make sense whether you knew, know key terms or whether you don't. So I'm just going to slide through. I'm going to try to be mindful of the time and make sure we finish up uh, right at um, 5.30 so I can give time to uh, get everybody signed in and signed out. So the overview of what we're going to talk about as quickly as possible is arousal versus anxiety and stress. We're going to talk about long-term effects of anxiety and stress. We're going to talk about physio physiological bases and effects of anxiety and stress. And you'll notice that I'm tying those two words together, anxiety and stress, because they're really kind of similar in some ways, though they'll be differentiated in some ways, and I'll talk about how those are similar and different. The anatomy and physiology of panic, so panic attacks being kind of the extreme end of anxiety, but anxiety attacks have the same physiology psychological and behavioral correlates of stress, anxiety, and panic, where we're going to talk about some classical conditioning, some operant conditioning, and some ways that you would look to um, help people out by extinguishing anxiety reactions. We'll talk about practical applications of this material, and then we'll describe two techniques for controlling anxiety and stress. We will not have time for the demonstration session today, but we will film that later in the studio, and we will put that up and probably somehow link the two together. Uh, if you want to come for that live, I'll be doing that uh, March 19th, Wednesday. It'll be the last session of the day. So, Arousal versus anxiety stress. Arousal is what we all have some of right now. If you lack arousal completely, you'd be unconscious, right? So arousal is a state of consciousness, and you could think about it in a number of different ways. You can think about it as attention or concentration or energy level, things of that nature, but essentially you have high levels and low levels. You might come in here and sit down after a long day and start lowering your arousal level until the point you're dead asleep, right? Or if you're having anxiety attack, your arousal level would be really, really high. And that's how we find that anxiety can be tied to some problems with performance, like test anxiety, speaking in public, and things of that nature, sports performance. But it's also something you can learn to manage, and that's something most people don't realize they can do. Some tasks we see that a moderate level of arousal is actually beneficial. In other words, you perform best at moderate levels, not low levels, and of course not high levels. Too low, you don't have the motivation or the energy to put into the work. Too high, and you're tweaking and freaking, and you can't concentrate and bring to bear the knowledge or the skills you have to apply the task. Stress can be an important motivator, so we want to differentiate stress Stress is not necessarily bad. All of us have stress of varying types in our life, and to the degree that it actually motivates you to do something to eliminate the source of the stress, that's a good thing, right? So a deadline, for example, puts the stress on you that gets you out of procrastination mode and gets you working on the thing that you're supposed to do, project, paper, whatever it is, studying in the case of college, right? So that you then deliver what you need to deliver and you remove the source of stress. But when stressors come too often, too far, too fast, too many, and you feel overwhelmed, that's distress, right? You go from a motivational kind of uh, arousal into being hamstrung and feeling helpless or hopeless and like you can't possibly get all the things accomplished you need to accomplish. And some sources of stressors you don't actually have control over. Things that we care about in life like other people and their health or their well-being or relationships or the economy and stuff that you might stress about but have no direct control over. So we look at this in terms of stress we can handle, stress we can't do anything about, and, and things we can do to pull ourselves out of distress back into a normal functional mode in life. So anxiety can also be thought of as an acute stress. It's an intense short term as opposed to a trait, state of a high arousal that's usually uncomfortable and experienced as uh, a negative personal emotional state. So people don't like anxiety, right? Somebody might say, well, I'm stressed, but I can handle it. But when you're anxious, that's a different level. And some people don't talk about it in those ways. So when we talk as healthcare providers to our patients or our clients, we want to be careful of the terminology we use. So I might say, well, hey, are you experiencing anxiety? 
And the person might go, no, I don't think I am. But if I say, hey, are you nervous? They'll go, oh yeah, I'm nervous all the time. And so what I consider to be a synonym, they don't see as a synonym. So when you're communicating, make sure you speak to people in the language that they understand. Physiologically, acute anxiety is an adrenaline response. An adrenaline response paired with glucocorticoids and other functions in the body to prepare you to fight or flight. The fight or flight response is a normal human and animal survival mechanism. It allows you to get out of very dangerous situations, whether you run away from them as fast as you can run or you fight as hard as you can fight to get out of them. And in a way, it's very adaptive. When you need that kind of a, a release, that's awesome, right? So if you were in a situation where you were threatened with, say, assault and you had that flood of adrenaline, you can do amazing things if you know what to do with it. That's why training helps in terms of things like uh, martial arts, which is learning to focus your mind so you can make use of that. But you can run as fast as you can run, or you can attack as hard as you can attack. But if you don't feel like you can do anything, you're just feeling awful as you stay there brimming with energy. And the energy you get is powerful. So people talk about, oh, I, I heard this story of a person who child trapped in her car was able to pull up a car. Isn't that amazing and miraculous? No. It's not superhuman. It's what you can do when you have intense focus and intense energy. Things that seem superhuman are super, but they're entirely human. The thing that's easiest to explain to a lot of people, y'all watch the show Cops? You ever seen the show Cops? Seems like every fifth episode or so they got a guy on PCP and he's jacked up and he's running and it takes like 10 people to drag him down and to hold him down. Why? Because he's jacked up on adrenaline. He's got constant and, and intense energy flowing through him. And he's usually naked and sweaty, which makes him hard to hold on to. But that not being the main point, he's sustaining a high level of energy that seems superhuman. But really, when you get down to how we're designed, we're pretty super as humans. We can do some pretty amazing things when called into those situations. However, when you don't have a real threat, physical threat, facing you, then feeling like that is terrible. It feels awful. It feels like you're dying. Literally like you're dying. Because if you were dying, that's what you'd feel like. Because that's what happens. When you have an external source of threat, then you have a way to label what's happening to you. If somebody pulled a gun out and you all of a sudden felt huge butterflies in your stomach or nausea and your heart rate started flying and you got clammy uh, hands or you started shaking, you would know why. You would be able to interpret that fear as an external threat. But if that happens to you all of a sudden, out of the blue, all of a sudden your stomach starts feeling weird, all of a sudden you start shaking, all of a sudden you start feeling your heart rate and your respiration rate change dramatically, and you can't find anything external to explain it, then there's only one place to turn, and that's inside. So people think that there's something terrible, terrible going on with them. They must be dying, and many people wind up in ERs. They will go to the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack, which is a fairly logical conclusion, right? And going to the ER, of course you should do all the tests to rule that out as a possibility, but having been ruled out as a possibility, when people are told, you, you seem to have had a panic attack, that's lost on a lot of people. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I think I'm having a heart attack or I'm going crazy. Anything that I can explain inside of myself is some kind of way of understanding this that I'm going through because it seems totally out of whack. But all human beings have this potential and this potential experience. About a third of all people will have a panic attack in their life, roughly speaking. May not be this year, maybe in 15 years. I've met people who had them in their 60s for the first time. Right? Doesn't guarantee that you're going to have any kind of long-term problem. It may be a one-time thing. Out of the blue is what we would consider. It seems to be that it came out of nowhere. That's one kind of panic attack. Another kind is situationally bound, like getting up to talk in front of people. Right? You start feeling the weakness in the legs. You start feeling that tremor in your stomach. But you know what's triggering it isn't a physical threat where you're going to get hurt, but a psychological threat where you might get negative evaluation from a bunch of people that are out there looking at you. Everybody's looking at me. Y'all are looking at me. And I could get really nervous about that. And it wouldn't take long before it started to swell into a full-blown panic episode. But I don't let it do that. I can manage it. So most people don't go on to develop anxiety disorders, but some do. And they can be very debilitating. But a lot of people suffer 
unnecessarily from anxiety that they could control if they were taught this information. Teaching this information is what motivates me. I don't get paid to do this talk. I do it because it's something I've found is very helpful to give to other people in the way of information. Somebody taught it to me, and I want to teach it to as many people as possible. As far as I'm concerned, the basics of this ought to be taught in elementary school, junior high school, and high school because we can prevent terrible experiences happening to people. But it's not a terrible experience per se because you go back to interpretation of what's happening and you find out that if you get on a roller coaster, assuming you enjoy roller coasters, right? You're on a roller coaster, you're heading for the end of the, the track where it swings off. Well, your, your base brain doesn't say, oh, well, we're locked in safe, right? And of course, we're going to make that right turn. It says you're going to fly off into space and die and it floods you with adrenaline which you then interpret as exciting and fun. So physiologically speaking, a panic attack and getting off the roller coaster are the same thing. They're both adrenaline releases. The interpretation is critical though. If you don't know what's happening to you, then you think it's gotta be a terrible thing. However, if you reinterpret it, you might be able to alleviate yourself of a lot of concern. Before I go and talk to this room that's full at the beginning of semesters with 320 people, on my way over, I start getting this sensation in my stomach. But I don't go, oh no, oh God, oh no. They're going to hate me. I'm going to talk a bunch of strangers and they're going to think I'm an idiot or I look goofy or whatever. I just go, ooh, butterflies. That's neat, right? Some people are adrenaline junkies. They actually seek the same experience that other people flee from. Why would you flee from it? Because your body tells you it's a bad thing unless you've radically reinterpreted the sensation, in which case you can see it as exciting and then channel your energy into whatever it is you're going to do. Stanley Schachter did a critical experiment showing how much of our emotion is based on contextual situational interpretation. So he shot people with epinephrine, which is adrenaline, right? And they didn't know what they were getting. They just know they were going to be injected with a drug and they would be filling out some questionnaires and people would be asking them about their experience. And unbeknownst to them, they were in a social psychological experiment. So you had two different groups of people who experienced two different conditions. Both groups got shot with the epinephrine. And in one condition, they go into a room to fill out some paperwork and there's another person in there that they think is another participant in the experiment, but is really a confederate, an actor pretending to be a participant. And they start reading the, the survey out loud, the actor does, and starts reading is like, how many extramarital affairs has your mother had in the last year? Ha! That's crazy. Why would they ask me that? I don't even talk to my mom that much. That's funny. Isn't that weird how they would ask you stuff like that? And they start acting giddy and happy and goofy, and they might make paper airplanes out of their, their survey and have a great time. All right? Now, the person who's got the epinephrine really is just watching that. That's the situation, the context in which they find themselves. In the other condition, people don't get that actor. They get a different actor, and that actor has a very different reaction. How many extramarital affairs? My mother, That's offensive. I can't believe anybody would ever... That, I, I refuse to answer anything like that. They have no right to ask and pry into my personal information like that. I can't believe that. And they start getting angry and upset. And they might ball up the thing. I'm not even going to answer anything like that. And they exhibit a very different kind of behavior. You take the people out and then ask them, what do you think the drug did to you? <laughs> right? What were the effects the drug had on you? Then people in condition A were liable to say, I don't know, but it really made me happy. I thought it was great. I wouldn't mind doing that again. They can, the context, right, contributed to them interpreting their physiological symptoms as excitement and fun. Over here, you got people in condition B saying, I don't know what that was, but I don't want any of it again because it's awful. It made me feel terrible because their contextual explanation is whatever's happening to this person is also happening to me. So being able to understand what's happening to you as nothing wrong with you as a human being, but basically an errant fight or flight reaction, a false alarm if you will, and that that's just a physiological process that would be exactly the same as you got on a roller coaster, it makes it a lot easier to understand it and to deal with it because you go, oh, well it's going to make my heart rate increase for a little while, it's going to make my breathing rate, if I start to do things I can actually control that myself and turn off the false alarm with a manual override. Long term effects of anxiety and stress, chronic stress can be pretty negative and People don't really understand the effects of this. Psychologically, they're like, isn't that all in your head? And I say, what isn't in your head? 
What exists for you? What interpretation do you have? What thought do you have? What belief do you hold? What experience do you engage in that is not mediated by your brain? What's not happening to you in the psychological fashion in some way or form, right? Everything that happens to us is, to a large degree, psychological, and there's nothing more powerful than the human mind that we know of. So, understanding that, you realize that you could have some serious physiological effects. Physical effects that people tend to think, well, mind-body dualism, like Descartes said. No, no. Mind and body intertwined. Holistic health, an approach that appreciates that the mind is not independent of the body and the body is not independent of the mind. So looking at chronic stress and anxiety, increasing, increasing glucocorticoids, you probably heard of cortisol, right, and corticosterone, decreases or is correlated with decreases in brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF which some people liken to brain fertilizer. It keeps neurons healthy, the brain cells are neurons, keeps them healthy and thriving. Well, deprived of that, they become unhealthy and can potentially die. And you can get neuronal death, brain cell death. Now, you got a lot of brain cells, right? And you don't grow a bunch of new ones. And you hear about the science of neuroplasticity on TV. And it's not on science of neuroplasticity. It's neuroscience and one of the features of your brain cells is that they have this plasticity. They have the ability to grow or to shrink depending on the condition. So if you lose some brain cells, either because a few of them die off or because you have some kind of trauma, a stroke, a lesion, a tumor, a traumatic brain injury from a blow to the head, if tissue dies off then the surrounding, you don't grow new neurons there, but some of the surrounding neurons, depending on how extensive the damage is, might grow their axons and or dendrites through that, that affected area and start to take over and adopt some of the functions that was previously taken care of by those neurons. So losing a few neurons is not that big of a deal, but you've only got so many, so keeping as many as you can is not a bad idea either. So where primarily we're looking at the hippocampus, which is primarily involved with memory formation. So one of the things that's common to people who suffer from long-term chronic stress is problems with concentration, problems with memory, because it seems like some of the areas most affected, one of which is, is the hippocampus, also include limbic structures, which are associated with motion and arousal. Well, you have to sustain arousal to maintain concentration. And you have to have good hippocampal function to generate new memories so that you're able to remember things from day to day. In addition to the glucocorticoids, a lot of times people with anxiety and stress problems have difficulty sleeping. They have racing thoughts. It makes it very, very difficult to relax and drift off to sleep if one thought after another thought after another thought is arousing you with fear, worry, anxiety, or stress. So, Chronic sleep difficulties and these increases in glucocorticoids seem to impair immune function. In other words, you actually become sicker easier and it's more difficult to recover because your immune functioning is suppressed by stress. That's a well-grounded finding scientifically. That's not just some kind of guru meditation thing that people want to discount. But they, be careful what you discount. Some things are packaged poorly but at their fundamentals are on the money. So what we're going to talk about in terms of breathing and muscle relaxation, some people are like, ain't that really similar to meditation? Yes! But you don't have to package it in some kind of Eastern philosophy or some kind of uh, terminology that people recoil from and don't listen to once they hear, right? When we're talking about breathing and we're talking about muscle relaxation, we're talking about controlling stress and guess what happens if you do certain things? You can reverse the process. You can make healthy again the neurons left in your hippocampal and, and limbic areas. Increased exercise does that. Exercise. Now, guess what? When people are depressed, they don't really want to exercise, right? Having fun does that. Intellectual stimulation does that. And antidepressant medications seem to do that, at least while you're taking them. But check this out. We have an association with anxiety and depression. In fact, of people who are clinically depressed, about 95% have elevated cortisol levels. Right? So there's a correlation there. Not necessarily causal, but there's an association, high comorbidity, which means co-occurring, anxiety disorders and mood disorders, depression especially. Anxiety and depression are linked. Doesn't mean because you're anxious you will become depressed. Doesn't mean because you're depressed you will become anxious, but the two overlap frequently. And they also overlap with substance abuse because as we'll find out, 
substances of certain types actually relax you and make it harder initially to have anxiety responses. But that becomes problematic and we'll talk about it. Antidepressant medications in St. John's wort, and be careful if you're taking St. John's wort because your pharmacist will tell you it interacts in a funky way with a lot of different medications. But if you're not taking any medications, it doesn't interact with them, right? Uh, and FDA doesn't approve it for a lot of reasons we won't go into today as a thing that cures or treats diseases. However, plenty of European random clinical studies, randomized clinical trials as they call them, show the efficacy in mild and moderate depression of St. John's Ward. Whatever the pharmacological mechanism, and we could go into that but won't today, the antidepressants in the St. John Wards appear to uh, decrease glucocorticoids, increase BDNF, yielding brain cell growth and survival, enhancing, right? But you know what? If it's mild to moderate, then you can do that yourself without medication. If it's anxiety, I don't recommend medication as a first line treatment. I didn't bother with my credentials early on, but I maybe should say that. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, right? And that's a licensure of a health service provider in the state of Tennessee. And I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and I hold an adjunct position in the Department of Family Medicine. So I've been working professionally treating people with anxiety for a long time, since about 1998. And I've worked with lots and lots of people, a handful, maybe two or three that I've recommended medication to as a frontline treatment for just anxiety. Depression's a different issue, but if it's just anxiety, I would much rather teach them what I'm teaching you today and have them work on that first because if they do it diligently, they can oftentimes alleviate their anxiety and that makes it so they don't need the medication. With antidepressants, that's a little bit different. Some of them are used to treat anxiety and they can be efficacious in that regard, but they're primarily used to treat depression and the best, best research that we have shows that a combination of medication and talk therapy yields the best outcomes where ultimately you come off the medication the theory being that the medication helps lift some of the symptoms of depression like lethargy, lack of energy, lack of motivation and that the person could then engage more wholeheartedly in the talk therapy learning strategies and techniques to improve their mood. Removing the antidepressants they now have a bunch of techniques and strategies that would work theoretically the next time they became depressed. If they do them properly they may avoid depression. So, anatomy and physiology of panic. Panic being the fight or flight response. This is important in understanding why breathing works. Because if you tell somebody who's panicking that they could get out of a panic attack by breathing, they'll say you're ridiculous. I've been told that, not directly, but implied many times. I've had people come to me and they say, I've heard that breathing thing, it doesn't work for me. I say, well, take a deep breath. And they go, Phew. I say, you're doing it wrong, and that's why it doesn't work. And that sounds silly if you don't understand the anatomy and physiology of the lungs and the bloodstream and oxygenation, carbon dioxide, etc. So let's talk a little bit about that. When you get anxious, your heart starts pumping more blood because you get tense. Your heart's a muscle, it starts using up oxygen. You get tense throughout your body, though you may not recognize that you do so. When I was, before community college, a delivery driver, my route being down a, a very busy section of Charlotte, North Carolina during rush hour traffic, if you'd ask me, are you stressed? I would say, no, I'm busy. I wouldn't label it as stress. But I started to develop headaches at my job. Go in, fine, start getting headaches. Don't know where they're coming from. Go home, a few hours later, they're gone. I didn't understand what was happening. Until one day I went to Wendy's, have a junior bacon burger with no cheese on it. And I went to bite into it and went, I had to pop my jaw open. Because it turned out, and it only occurred to me at that moment, that I was driving around with my jaw locked. Everywhere. They weren't GPS back then. You had to actually map out your entire route. You had to compete with all this traffic, and I'm going, and I'm good at it. I was not calling it stress but I was carrying the stress physically by locking down my jaw. And being mindful of that, not having any community college at that point, I just stopped doing it. I was, became mindful not to lock my jaw down, no more headaches. Still was able to do my job. So when you're tense, you're using up oxygen and you're generating carbon dioxide and you're starting to put your blood out of balance. You start breathing more rapidly, but not more deeply. So people start, 
You can move a lot of air up here, but it's not going to the right places in your lungs. And where is the right place? The bottom and the periphery of the lungs. We want to get it to the alveoli because when we get out of balance, our pH starts to shift. Y'all know pH, right? Bases and acids, neutral is seven. We got a very narrow window as we'll see. When we start to move out of that window, our base brain reads that as you're dying and it gives you more adrenaline as a response. So you get this increasing intensity uh, where you are now building up more carbon dioxide and you are not getting enough oxygen. So because people breathe through their upper airway all the time, they think that's normal. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says, take a deep breath, people go, <sighs> your doctor should say, wrong. <sighs> Belly breathing. You put a little baby on its back, does it start going? <sighs> no, its belly goes up and down. The natural breathing mode is with belly. Why belly? Because that's where your diaphragm is. You pull down and out on your diaphragm and you actually create a vacuum to suck the air to the bottom of your lungs, which is exactly where you want to get it. When you breathe up here in the upper respiratory tract, you know, you're not becoming an efficient breather, you're becoming an inefficient breather. So we want to move the belly up and down in a very systematic way. In the blood, we got this narrow balance, respiratory acidosis occurs when we get out of whack. So some of the symptoms that then come about as a consequence of being anxious now, keep in mind, you started off anxious, right? Now your heart's beating faster, you're using up more oxygen, but you're not getting more because you're going <sighs> and breathing shallow to the upper airway, right? So now you get additional symptoms that include things like increased heart rate and shortness of breath which is exactly what we feel when we're having a panic attack anyway, so it just makes things worse. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, y'all know carbon dioxide is a poison, you get too much of it, you die. Right? That's why there's a narrow balance, but your cells manufacture it and they have to exit the bloodstream in the lower and peripheral areas of the lung through structures called alveoli. Little structures that look like bubble wrap and they have your little capillaries, blood vessels where these gases are exchanged and we won't go into adenosine triphosphate uh, ATP. But basically this is what we're looking at. The physiology of your lungs and anatomy or anatomy of your lungs, and physiology of your bloodstream and the things we're talking about with acidosis. You got up here a giant tube, right? You got your trachea. Gas exchanges do not take place here. Then you branch off to your primary bronchi, another large tube. And then smaller tube, secondary, smaller tube, tertiary, get out here to the bronchioles and what do we see? Down at the very end and largely the bottom and periphery of the lungs, that's where your alveoli are. Look like little broccoli upside down, doesn't it? I mean, you look at broccoli floor, it's like real close, you see those little tiny bubbles? That's where you got to get the air. But people don't get the air when they breathe up here. You can move a lot of volume of air without directing it down here. So if I take a deep breath in, a conscious breath in, a slow breath in through the nose, not that you have to breathe in through the nose, but it seems we're developed to breathe in through the nose. You clean the air, you moisten the air, right? You heat the air as it goes in through your nose. That's what all those mucous membranes and hairs are for that you try to cut and trim up, right? They're there for a reason. But if I breathe in, I'm gonna start at the belly, Pull it way out. My chest didn't move, but my ribs expanded and my lungs are full, right? So if I breathe up here, I can move a lot of air that's not getting to where I need it to be. And if I look at the exhale portion of this respiratory cycle, I breathe in and out. And that feels like the end of the breath because that seemed natural, but I'm talking and you can't talk without air. And if I push in and up, I go. <laughs> and that much air was in the bottom of my lungs. It's what we would call stale air, right? It's sitting in there. It's not going to hurt you. It's carbon dioxide rich and oxygen poor, and it's taking up volume. So the idea is that you use your diaphragm by sticking it out, and I don't care what I look like. Some people are like, what do people see me do that? And I say, well, you could just tell them what you're doing because they probably don't know and probably could benefit from that. But I understand that not everybody's as comfortable as that. I don't mind. I taught it to a bunch of sixth graders once who went to school with my son. They went back the next day, and they're like, he stuck his belly out. He stuck his belly way out. 
It was look weird. I like, so what? But I could do the same thing. I can sit at my desk and do it. I can make it not obvious and do exactly the same thing. By pulling my belly out, I'm just pulling out the diaphragm, which creates the vacuum that sucks the air to the bottom. By exhaling slowly through the mouth and then pulling in and up on the diaphragm, I'm kicking out the stale air such that each breath in is bringing in nothing but oxygenated air, which is what I need at the moment, right? That's what I'm, why is your heart rate going faster when you have a fight or flight response? Because if you have to run or fight, you need oxygen and a lot of it, right? If you learn how to manage this, you can do all kinds of other things. People who have asthma can benefit from this. As I'll show you, there's all kinds of benefits to understanding this. What happens with asthma? Airways constrict, right? Well, it turns out that you don't need your airways to be all open. But if you don't know that and you start having an asthma attack and it feels like you can't breathe, it becomes what? Frightening. And then you can panic, which makes the situation worse. Speaking in terms of oxygen, which is what you're after. And the same thing with COPD and emphysema. Emphysema, people have chronic smoking, they're coating their lungs in tar. They may or may not develop lung cancer, but one thing they're definitively doing is coating their lungs in tar and toxins. And over the period of years, that becomes problematic. It weakens these alveoli and they cough, <laughs> huge, powerful, painful sounding coughs. My next door neighbor used to cough so hard in the morning I could hear him in our apartment and it sounded like he was throwing a lung on the floor because he smoked every day and then he, he would clear that out and he would get on with the day and sometimes it would be like that. But you can imagine doing that for tens of years and weakening these, you start popping them. Lack of alveoli, you don't get them back. You pop enough and it doesn't, what do we have to do? Now to get oxygen, we have to put it directly into your airway. Right? That's what oxygen tanks do. They just raise the concentration of, of oxygen in the air you're taking in. But there's a certain point at which if you pop enough of them, you can't put enough oxygen into somebody's airway because you have to have these to live. So interestingly, this helps for COPD as well. I do this demonstration because I think it's a powerful way to show what I'm talking about. If you're an athlete, for example, breathing like this, as you're running is a far more efficient way than breathing <laughs> like this. I taught that to some kids who played soccer. Some of them thought I was ridiculous and they didn't do it. A couple other ones did it and said, wow, that really works. I'm like, exactly, because guess what you do when you run up and down the field? You burn oxygen and produce carbon dioxide and you just reverse that process. You have more energy, more stamina, right? Less fatigue. But if I've got asthma and my bronchioles are constricting, I'm not saying don't take medication, and I should say also, if you're on medication for anxiety, don't abruptly quit it, even if you master these techniques. Some of the medications you could take for anxiety could be very dangerous if you quit them cold turkey, so talk to your doctor before you did anything like that. But, it's a pen, smaller than a straw, on this end, and if I breathe correctly, the way I'm telling you, stomach, out, using the diaphragm, I can get all the air I need to live through that tiny little hole. So I'll do it. I could do that all day if I had to. So if you're having an asthma attack and you realize that the only tube you need is this big, the tubes that are still open are far bigger than that and more plentiful than that, and you start managing your breathing, COP the same way, you run out of oxygen in your tank and you need to get across the room to get another tank, managing your breathing can give you the energy and oxygen you need to get through that attack and right on past it in asthma. You might need a short acting inhaler and that's fine. But you see what I'm saying here? This is powerful. I can change my own blood pressure. And I did it yesterday at the doctor. I've done it before. 
at the uh, Red Cross, I donate blood, and you're not supposed to drink a lot of caffeine before you come in, you're not supposed to come in late, and I came in late running in, and I was all, you know, jacked up on caffeine I wasn't supposed to drink, and I sat down, and they took my blood pressure, and they said, you can't donate blood, your blood pressure's too high. I said, oh, yeah, okay, of course, uh, give me a minute. <sighs> Start doing progressive muscle relaxation, literally in 60 seconds. Okay, go ahead and take it again. Utterly normal. Now that means I can control my asthma attacks, COPD, blood pressure, which is implicated in things like heart attacks. I can even control pain. I don't brag about it because it's not a big accomplishment, but this back tooth right here is all just metal. And they had to drill it out three times. And you know how much anesthetic I took for it? None. I just sat there and did deep breathing. After the big one that, you know, the whole thing got replaced, the dentist is like, how do you experience that? And I said, do you mean does it hurt? He's like, yeah. I was like, of course it hurts. You're drilling out the tooth, it hurts like hell. But I'm managing the pain through this concentrated breathing rhythm where I'm focused on that, realizing that as soon as you lift the drill up, the pain stops. So you have this power within you that if you learn how to activate it, allows you to do some pretty amazing things. In terms of performance, again, high levels of anxiety can be helpful. Creates, you know, excuse me, uh, moderate levels of, of anxiety can be helpful. Creates the arousal you need, but high levels of anxiety create a physical stressor that you're then worried about because you feel your legs getting weak or you feel your arms shaking and you start going, oh my God, what's happening to me? And you start then getting into this cognitive interpretation where you start catastrophizing. Oh, I'm going to do a terrible job. They're going to think I'm awful. And these bad thoughts then feed on themselves to make the threat seem bigger. And ultimately, you're now creating a worse and worse situation. And if you could just calm your body down, it makes it so much easier to calm yourself cognitively. And you can start to use, see, phobia is irrational by definition. People who have phobias, which means they panic at very specific situations, they know it's irrational. But you can't think your way out of panic. You can't think your way out of having a panic attack because it's not your forebrain that's in control. It's your base brain, your survival mechanisms. But if you can learn to override those by calming your body down, then it becomes a lot easier to engage your mind and start using those logical things like if it's test anxiety going, now I know I've studied a lot, I'm just over aroused right now, what I need to do is breathe and calm down because I know everything I need to know. If it's performance anxiety in front of a bunch of people, you can go, I know most people don't give a damn about what I'm about to say up here. They're not out there judging me harshly. Most of them are half not paying attention or playing Flappy Bird or they're on Facebook or they're drifting off going, man, I'm hungry. Won't he only shut up? Please stop talking. Right? They do all that stuff that has nothing to do. And I could do the worst job and some people will think it's good. And I could do the best job and some people will think it sucked. So it's kind of independent what I do in a lot of ways. I can cognitively, when they tell you to imagine the audience in their underwear, I don't do that. I don't have time for that. What are they trying to do? Make people not intimidated by the audience, right? But that's all in your mind. There is no actual intimidation. Nobody's going to throw darts at you, right? Nobody's going to take shots at you. And some people don't like no matter what you do. So those tasks which are well learned or easy are the ones where modern anxiety is called for. Moderate anxiety, we would call it moderate arousal. Moderate levels of arousal will help you. Low arousal, not much investment, not much energy, not usually done well. The trick then is learning how to manage it. It's not something that you have to be overwhelmed by. Most people don't experience anxiety as something they have control over. It's something that controls them. But knowing all this material puts you in a very different position because now you understand what's going on physiologically. We'll talk a bit about why it happens psychologically in just a second. But when I teach this to people, when I have time to do the, the actual demonstration of it, it is not uncommon for people to fall asleep because they come into this room or any room I'm talking in and I have medium levels of arousal. I teach them to do the progressive muscle relaxation while they're doing the deep breathing and their arousal level gets so low that they nod off, which is fine. And I tell people, well, if you're done now and you'd like to wake up, you can. And like, wow, I was really relaxed there. But if you're in a high stress, high anxiety situation and you look at this as kind of a gauge, you don't go to sleep doing this. 
you get normal, middle levels of arousal, which means you're changing this into this. Well, this is the Yerkes Dotson Law of Arousal. It says at low levels of arousal, the quality of performance tends to be kind of low. It increases the quality as the arousal goes up to a point. And then the higher it gets past that point, the worse the performance is. So in classic test anxiety situations, that's what you're talking about. You give a test and you got those students that come in and like, oh man, we had a test today? Really? Oh well. Right? They didn't have any stress. There was no pressure. They didn't study. They don't care. They don't do well. Right? But then the other student who comes in, they were stressed. They want that A. They want to work real hard. They study and they study and they study and they study and they get in the testing situation and they're like, oh my God, what if I don't remember? Tests always freak me out. Oh my God, I'm a terrible test taker. And they start telling themselves these things that then jack their anxiety way up. Now they're freaking and tweaking and they aren't remembering what they studied because they're interfering with their own recall by these high levels of arousal, then they do poorly and go, I knew I wasn't going to do on, good on that test. Self-fulfilling prophecy, which then confirms in their mind that I'm just not a good test taker. Right? So when you're combating test anxiety, the trick is, of course, to study as much as you need to study to understand and master the information. Once you mastered the information, no test should be intimidating. But if you're intimidated by it, now you know what to do with that level of arousal that's too high. You sit there and breathe until you feel calm. And then you start your test. And if it starts to come back, you do it again. Persistence and consistency is what counts here. You have to practice this to get good at it. There's all kinds of things that we could talk about further. And again, and if you're in my class, we're talking about it now. <laughs> Classical conditioning and operant conditioning. If you don't understand what that is because you're not in one of these classes, that's fine. If you're in my class, you should understand this very well. It will be on your next test, right? Classical conditioning is the physiological response. So, right, you've got ring a bell, give the dog food, ring a bell, give the dog food, ring a bell, give the dog food. It takes a lot of time doing that, but eventually you ring the bell and the dog starts salivating as though food was in front of it. It takes a lot of trials to establish that. But for fear, pain, and sickness, one trial is all you need. How many times on the hot stove to learn that one? One time. How many times sticking your finger in the electric socket? One time, right? How many times you get a gun pointed to you on a corner before you feel really weird about going back to that corner? One time, because it's a survival mechanism. Your base brain is trying to find situations that are dangerous and give you that fight or flight energy to get out of there so that you go into a situation. And this happens with a lot of people with panic. If I'm panicking right now, for example, and I could be, I'm not, but let's just pretend that I am. I'm not thinking, look, hardwood floors, a chalkboard, a big screen, black t-shirts, tattoos but all of that's around me and your base brain is good at taking in cues right it's looking for the bell that predicts the bad situation so now I have the panic attack and I'm thinking not any of these things I'm thinking oh god this feels terrible how am I gonna get it to stop I'm gonna try the best I can once it stops I'm gonna probably avoid that similar situation but let's say I go over to my friend's house now where I've never had a panic attack before and now we're hanging out and they've got hardwood floors and I don't consciously know what the hell's happening, but all of a sudden my heart starts racing. Right? All of a sudden I start feeling weird and clammy in my hands, and I'm starting to panic. And I don't realize that the conditioned stimulus would be the hardwood floors which were present the last time I had a panic attack, and now that's the trigger. And my friend's wearing a black shirt and has tattoos, and that makes it weird too. And then that can become a trigger. So I go, out of my friend's house. Now I have a hard time ever going back in my friend's house. I'm embarrassed. And now it becomes a conditioned stimulus to trigger my anxiety response. Now I go to Walmart. And I encounter somebody with a black shirt and tattoos. And I say hi because I'm not afraid of black shirts or tattoos. But all of a sudden I start feeling that feeling. And I have no idea why. It seems like it's out of the blue. But what's happening? Another conditioned stimulus is now triggering a fight or flight response. And what happens when you feel that way? You get out. You flight instead of fight. 
That's the best way to handle any threat is to leave rather than fight. You can get hurt fighting. You're less likely to get hurt and that's what happens in the animal world. When you see aggression in the same species to establish dominance or mating patterns or things of that nature, they're not fighting to hurt one another. They're fighting to establish right, hierarchy. If they actually find themselves in threatening situations, they usually run if they can. Because if you get hurt in the wild, you become prey. Right? So it's a good thing to have when you need it. But now we have this advanced society where I'm not likely to be threatened by too many things external. Car crashes, tornadoes, terrorists. Yes, things exist that, that could hurt me. But statistically speaking, they're not likely to. But here I have this mechanism that's gearing me to look for danger. And if I have it triggering, what I get is this cascading effect, chaining new condition stimuli, and I'm leaving the situation or avoiding the situation, which limits my life and ensures that I'll keep it that way. In other words, I won't get hurt, but I'll also not get rid of that anxiety feeling. To get rid of it, you have to keep people in the very situations they fear until they're rea relaxed, making sure, of course, there's no actual harm that would come to them. That's the key. Getting them to learn to relax and then exposing them to the stimuli that they fear either imaginally through systematic desensitization or in vivo in an actual situation where you walk them through step by step. Anxiety's getting bigger. Okay. Relax. Where's your anxiety now? Scale of one to ten. And it's about a, about a three now. Let's move a little bit closer to that. Let's stay a little bit longer. Never leave a situation in which you're anxious because to do so is operantly conditioning yourself to do it again. That's negative reinforcement. It takes away a bad feeling, so you're more likely to do it the next time. And if you do that continually, you'll never extinguish the anxiety response. So that is essentially the essence of the classical and operant conditioning which work together. Relaxation is the basis of the Effective treatments for phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, etc. If you've got these issues, you'll probably want to find a good cognitive behavioral therapist or somebody that understands systematic desensitization and or exposure therapy. Because it works and it works well. And that's why I don't recommend to people with anxiety problems and only anxiety problems that they start with medication. Because these work to eliminate the source of the anxiety. Whereas the medication for anxiety oftentimes eliminates the symptoms but what you have is a medication, be it alcohol or be it Oxycontin, central nervous system depressants that people get, and they might take and it makes them feel a lot more calm in situations, then they need to take more. Tolerance starts to build, and then they need to drink more, and then they need to take more pills. Well, you can have pills prescribed to you, and that's what happens. If you need a Xanax to get on an airplane one time, that's not a bad thing. That's not a big deal. Right? If you take it 30 minutes before you know the source of the anxiety is going to be there, you should be able to maintain more calm in that situation. But if you have a lot of anxiety, right, and you take it on a regular basis, then you'll become tolerant and you'll need more of it. Well, then you'll need more of it to be effective. And eventually, if it's being prescribed to you, you'll have levels at which they can't prescribe higher levels that are no longer abating your anxiety. So now you have dependence on a prescribed medication along with the original anxiety problem that you had. And for people who aren't being prescribed it, but are taking either alcohol or illicit drugs that they get through illicit means, same thing's happening. A lot of people self-medicate themselves into having two problems. Because it doesn't fix the anxiety. These things I'm talking about do. That's the same thing I was talking about. Ring the bell, give food, ring the bell, give food, ring the bell, give food, ring the bell. Don't give food, dog salivates, right? It took a while to acquire that, the acquisition phase. But then it's pretty regular. But you keep ringing the bell and not giving food, the dog doesn't keep salivating. Eventually, it realizes the bell doesn't predict food anymore. Salivation stops. But some period of time goes by, and you ring the bell again, and you've got a recurrence of the salivation response. Not at peak levels, but moderate levels. If you don't give food, it goes away quicker and stays away longer. However, during this spontaneous recovery of this conditioned reaction, if you go back and give the unconditioned stimulus again, then the next time you ring the bell, you get full on response as if you had never extinguished it. We talked about how this applies to drug use in class today, and the same thing applies to drug addictions where people go to rehab and extinguish their cravings, but then go back to where they live and all of a sudden the craving comes back. And as long as they can stay away from that, it'll go away quicker, stay away longer. But if they don't understand any of these processes, and most people don't because they don't get taught this, 
and you should teach it to others. If they take that drug thinking I just need a little bit of a hit or a little bump or a little toke or a little whatever it is I do to get me over to a bad hump, all of a sudden all their cravings come back and they think they're a failure. Same thing happens in phobias, PTSD, treatment with these kind of things. So I've got somebody afraid to go to Walmart. I've got somebody afraid to go to their friend's house. I've got somebody afraid to stand on stage where they first had their panic attack. And I can now give them the relaxation techniques, put them in situations like this, either simulated by imagining it, simulated in situations where they're actually in similar situations, or going to the very situations themselves until they're calm and they extinguish that. So now those situations don't fire off the anxiety response. They don't kick in the fight or flight response. But sooner or later, it's coming back. Right? Sooner or later, spontaneously, you might be at another store similar in some ways to the Walmart you had your panic attack and all of a sudden that heart rate starts coming back but if you now are armed with this information you don't go oh my god it's coming back what do I do what do I do you go oh spontaneous recovery of my anxiety reaction probably triggered by something in the environment I don't know what it is but it's an errant fight or flight response it's a false alarm what I need to do is stay right here and breathe myself into calmness <sighs> until you're calm and don't leave until you're calm because if you leave you then reinforce the very thing you extinguished. But if you handle it, it goes away quicker and stays away longer. So here's some words of wisdom. If you don't do them, they don't work. Why do I spend all this time telling people all this back information? Because if you don't, it sounds absurd. If you understand all of this, you're like, oh, that's why breathing works. But most people hear that and they're like, man, you don't know what I'm going through. If you think breathing different is going to help me. And I say, well, that seems plausible, I understand, but believe me, all the years I've been doing this with all the people I've been doing it with, yes, actually, it does work. If you don't do it right, it ain't going to work, right? Breathing into the upper chest, it ain't going to work. If you don't do it long enough, oh my God, it's not going away, I got, and then I freak out and quit, right? It's a hormone, it's not a neurotransmitter. Once you get shot with adrenaline, it's going to take seconds to minutes to clear it out. It's going to take four or five minutes. I've sat with people who've gone from panic attack states to calm in five minutes. No drugs. All I did was talk them through the breathing process and muscle relaxation process, which then they calmed themselves with. And if they had been practicing that, right, right, if they had been practicing that, they would think to use them. Because if you don't practice it, you won't think to use it. You'll be panicking. You won't go, oh my God, oh my God, oh, I need to breathe. You're going to go, oh my God, oh my God, and you're going to have the panic attack, or you're going to have the anxiety attack, or you're going to get out of there and reinforce that response, right? But if you've been practicing this 15 minutes a day, day in, day out, then you can do what I can do, which is any situation, any time in my life that I start feeling anxiety, I automatically start my breathing techniques. And I automatically start tensing and releasing muscles, because paradoxically, if you tense muscles, it relaxes them. Run up 10 flights of stairs and see how your legs feel when you get to the top, right? Relaxed, right? You want to sit down. By tensing and releasing, that's isometrics. Y'all know isometric exercises? I can push against the wall really hard. Wall doesn't move. I don't move. But I'm using my muscles intensely. So by pairing the breathing, systematic, slow, in through the nose, out through the mouth, counting. And we'll have to do another video to give the demonstration. And the muscle relaxation. I can bring myself into a profound state of calm, breathing as few as two times a minute because as I demonstrated it to you with the pen, I'm breathing so efficiently I don't need more than two breaths a minute. Most people breathe eight to ten breaths a minute, twelve, something like that. That's the power that you can give to yourself. So if you do this reliably over time, your anxiety will become manageable possibly go away entirely and if it doesn't then you should seek out a therapist to help you do it further breathing in count your pace maybe I do five on the way in I put my hand on my stomach hand on my chest just to make sure that I'm not breathing with my chest and out slower in and up on the diaphragm clear out that stale air repeat repeat Repeat, get slower, get deeper, more efficient breathing. And then you start pairing that. And if you want any of these uh, handouts or this, or this PowerPoint, just email me at doulac at ETSU and I'll email them to you. I'll give them to you. 
I have a, a handout that covers this, but basically the progressive muscle relaxation, what's progressive about it? I would go with my feet first, be establishing my deep breathing, then I would do my feet, then I would do my calves, then I would do my upper legs, then I would do my stomach and lower back, next deep breath, each one's a deep breath, so it takes a while to do this, but the more you do it, the better you get at it, so that when it happens to you, that you experience anxiety, whether it's at a test, or talking in front of a group, or just having a panic attack, you'll think to do it, you'll do it well, you'll be in control, and the anxiety won't be in control. So that's about all we have time for today. I appreciate you coming.